D. James Kennedy Ministries presents Truths That Transform. We mark Thanksgiving on today's Truths That Transform and clear away a fog of lies. Simple, revolutionary. It was a polarity change in world government. Instead of top down, ruled by these kings that keep getting more and more powerful, it's bottom up. Modern revisionist historians slander the pilgrims, but we will share the truth about them and the freedom they left behind for us on today's Truths That Transform. Welcome to Truths That Transform, a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries where we are standing for truth and defending your freedom. This week is Thanksgiving and it's particularly noteworthy this year because it's the 400th anniversary of the first Thanksgiving held by the pilgrims at Plymouth. Over the past century, the pilgrims have become vilified as university faculties have moved increasingly leftward. Because of widespread historical ignorance, they've been able to uproot our history by portraying the pilgrims as bloodthirsty imperialists bent on subjugating people. But that false and libelous picture is ridiculous on its face. It was derived from the fevered imaginings of the intellectual descendants of Karl Marx. On this program, you will discover the true history of these first settlers in America, and you'll see how they laid the groundwork for the liberty we still enjoy today. The Providence Forum and outreach of this ministry and our own Dr. Jerry Newcomb have produced a new documentary called The Pilgrims. After a harrowing trip to America, what did they do? And how does it affect us even now? We take a closer look at the pilgrims. On November 9, 1620, 66 days after their departure, they first sighted land off Cape Cod. Being thus arrived in a good harbor and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all the perils and miseries thereof, again to set their feet on the firm and stable earth. William Bradford. Since they were sailing to the northern parts of Virginia, they realized they had been blown off course. It turns out they were some 250 miles off course. But their attempts to sail south were completely hindered by dangerous shoals along the coast. They interpreted this as the hand of God guiding them to stay there. So they stayed in Cape Cod and landed on the Provincetown tip. For the next several weeks, they would explore the coast of Cape Cod, looking for a place to settle down. However, they had to clear something up first before they set a foot on the new land. They had to stifle a potential mutiny before it happened. When the Mayflower Compact was written November 11, 1620, on board the Mayflower itself, it was written in order to stop a mutiny, a potential mutiny, where some of the ones who were not part of the church said, hey, we'll do what we want to do. Thus, before disembarking, the pilgrims ended up making world history by writing up what Winston Churchill called one of the remarkable documents in history. It was a key forerunner to the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. It was the Mayflower Compact. In the name of God, Amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign lord, King James, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Do buy these present, solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one of another, 
covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic, for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. The Mayflower Compact. They do something unique. They create their own government. They call it the Mayflower Compact. We, in the presence of God, covenant ourselves together to form a civil body politic to enact just and equal laws as shall be thought most meet or necessary, unto which we promise all due submission. Simple, revolutionary. It was a polarity change in world government. Instead of top down, ruled by these kings that keep getting more and more powerful, it's bottom up. It's the people themselves deciding what laws they're gonna pass and agreeing to submit to them. It was a polarity change in world government. And yet the Mayflower Compact, when it was written, it deals with both converted and unconverted. It deals with believers and unbelievers as equals before the law. This is way ahead of their time. This is where John Robinson taught them to be uh, tolerant toward other people, to be respectful of other people, even if you disagree. And this laid a very important seed in America. In the cabin of the Mayflower, humanity recovered its rights and instituted government on the basis of equal laws enacted by all the people for the general good. George Bancroft. They put the building blocks down for the writing of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Those building blocks came from the pilgrims who built a civil government on biblical law. The only way you can build a civil government. The Mayflower Compact was signed November 11, 1620. For the next several weeks, small exploring parties of the pilgrims would set out ashore to discover the lay of the land. They even found a hidden mound of several ears of corn stored by some Indians. That corn saved their lives. So they come to land, they find this cache. Now, it's 1620. They are the most faithful individuals that you can ever realize. And when they found this cache of, of corn, they said, praise God. God provided this for us. When they landed on the tip of Cape Cod, they had run out of food. The men looked around the Cape, found a stash of corn buried in the ground by the Indians, and they took it. They did not steal the corn, they borrowed it, they paid it back later. And in Bradford's diary, when they started meeting with the Native Americans, Bradford said to the envoy going, find out whose corn that was so we can repay it. Had they not taken it, they never would have survived. Because you see, by the end of the first winter, they were doling out a quarter pound of cornbread per person per day to survive on. So as you can well imagine, the mothers took their bread and fed their children. They covered their children with their own bodies to keep them warm. Of those 18 married women, 14 died the first winter, sacrificing themselves for the next generation, knowing if they did not survive, we would not survive. As the pilgrims continued to explore the shoreline of Cape Cod, on December 11th, they came across Plymouth for the first time. It proved to be the ideal place to make their new home. Let's get the scene, wrong place, wrong time, they're all sick, they have come to land in Plymouth. They've decided this is the place because of Town Brook, they were looking for water. In, Brad, in Bradford's diary it says we're very much without ale, we have to land. Because they had ale because ale would, would be much more potable than water. They drunk our first New England water with as much delight as ever we drunk drink in all our lives. William Bradford. During that first winter of 1620 to 1621, they had to stay aboard the ship. It was too difficult to build houses and buildings in the freezing, howling wilderness. That winter proved to be a season of death for the pilgrims. Just about every day, three or four of them died. Only four families remained intact after that brutal winter of 1620 to 1621. The pilgrims were to find out after settling in Plymouth that in that area, most of the Indians had actually been wiped out in a plague that took place three years before the voyage of the Mayflower. In the end, Plymouth and Cape Cod proved to be one of the safest places the pilgrims possibly could have come to set up their peaceful haven for religious liberty. When the ice cleared up, 
Captain Jones knew he could now sail the Mayflower back to England. Before he left, he gave an invitation to any of them all, saints or strangers, to return home to England to give it up. After all, half of their number had died that first winter. But no pilgrim took him up on his offer. The church was the central focus of the pilgrim's colony. The first building they built served as a church, as a meeting house like a town hall, and even housed some of them. They would often march to church with a drummer ahead of them and with the men bearing muskets and swords for protection. Love, without the number one commandment, everything else makes no sense. Sunday was an all-day affair. It was, it was huge. You know, when you do the, um, they do the reenactment of the Pilgrim Progress, when they walk, they're walking to church. The Psalms provided the main hymn book for the pilgrims. Bow down thine ear, Jehovah, answer me. In fact, the whole Bible was the center of their colony and the core of its entire purpose. The, the pilgrims did live according to the Bible. There's no, that was their textbook for life. People come here and they say to me, this is wonderful, but these children, they couldn't have been well educated. There was no formal school, and there wasn't. But they were well educated. They learned at home, their parents taught them, and their textbook was the Bible. But they did have supplementary materials. Governor Bradford himself brought over 400 books with him on the Mayflower. The governor could speak five languages. Do you understand how essential Christianity was to the mission of the pilgrims and how their Christianity was the root of liberty in America? Even if you did know that, there's a very good likelihood that your children and grandchildren do not. Our public schools divested of any religious influence and promoting a strident secularism largely teach myths and untruths about the early Americans. Among those falsehoods is the notion that the pilgrims came to subjugate or even wipe out indigenous peoples. There's just one problem with that idea. It's a fatuous falsehood, not even remotely connected with the truth. Here's more as we continue our look at the Providence Forum's special program, The Pilgrims. And in a few moments, we'll tell you how you can get the entire uncut documentary on DVD. As the winter of 1621 turned to spring, an Indian man walked into the fledgling new colony. His name was Samoset, who was a friendly man, declaring, Hello, Englishman. He came back soon with another Indian who would turn out to be critical for the pilgrim's survival. His name was Squanto. And I call him the land bridge, the, the, the human bridge to Western civilization. He was a Native American who was taken to England, became a Christian, learned English, and when the pilgrims came, he was a human bridge for the, for the pilgrims to interpret and translate to the natives the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Squanto continued with them and was their interpreter and was a special instrument sent of God for their good beyond their expectation, William Bradford. Squanto taught them how to catch eel and how to grow corn. Squanto also translated for them as they negotiated a long-lasting treaty of peace with the Indians, which was signed by their chief, Massasoit. Bradford says Squanto was a, uh, an amazing vessel sent by God to help them. Um, they now have an interpreter, and of course eventually have that peace treaty, only a few days later with Massasoit, uh, who comes with uh, uh, several of the Indian chiefs, and they, they sit down, uh, he's the chief, but they come with several warriors, and they sit down and they make that uh, peace treaty uh, right here in Plymouth. If he didn't sign that peace treaty, the pilgrims wouldn't have survived. And it lasted 55 years, but three years into that peace treaty, Massasoit was at his camp in Rhode Island. See, back then the Wampanoag lived right here in Plymouth and on Cape Cod and in New Bedford and in Rhode Island. He was chief of all of them. Now he's at his camp in Rhode Island, the man had the plague, he was dying. A gentleman from Plymouth by the name of Edward Winslow put some herbs together, and Ed Winslow walked to Rhode Island to nurse Massasoit back to health. 
Winslow walked 40 miles. Halfway there, he was met on a path by an Indian who told him not to bother finishing the trip. Massasoit died. Well, he finished the trip anyway, and he discovered Massasoit had not yet died. He was very close, and Ed Winslow nursed him back to health. From that day forward, they were great friends, and that peace treaty was even stronger. There's really three entities. There's the pilgrims, there's the strangers, and there's the Native Americans. And they needed to learn how to get along and, and and in a cohesive nature when, when they came here. The Indians in that particular area had been very hostile to Europeans, yet most of them had died off in a plague that swept through there a few years before the pilgrims came. Yeah, had not the pilgrims settled in Plymouth, a lot of the tribes here were very hostile and they would have been in trouble. But also keep this in mind, the Pawtuxets were hostile. Had the Patuxet Indians survived that plague, they probably would have wiped the pilgrims out. The pilgrims, who came in peace, came onto a territory that was not a barren wilderness with the need to clear all the land. There were already cultivated fields. Meanwhile, the pilgrims, being dedicated to living out their faith, made sure that they paid a fair and just price for everything. That included the land. There was not one square inch of property they purchased that Chief Massasoit did not approve the land sale first. See, the Indians didn't want the land. They wouldn't come back on it because of the plague. The pilgrims took land nobody wanted. Everything after that they paid for to the Chief Massasoit. And this is very important because if we cannot own property, we have absolutely no power. We have right in Plymouth all the land deeds that have been recorded and that uh, Indian chiefs gave their signature to. Uh, do you know it's interesting that all the land here, uh, William Bradford would not allow another colonist from the English to ever sign a land deed without the personal permission of Massasoit. Massasoit had to give his permission to make sure that they weren't being cheated. In later eras, European settlers as well as Americans mistreated Native Americans in grave miscarriages of justice. But in doing so, they were not at all following the example of the pilgrims. The pilgrims had good relationships with the Indians. The pilgrims were kind to the Indians. They showed them love. They showed them compassion. They showed them the godly way to live. The pilgrims planted their crops and enjoyed the first harvest. They set aside time to thank God. They had survived in the new land. The first Thanksgiving was in October of uh, 1621. They planted their corn and they cleared land, but there was a great drought that came upon the land, and the pilgrims called a day of fasting and prayer, called the Indians together with them to observe, and they fasted and prayed, and they called upon God to send rain, to send rain to water the crops, otherwise they would all be without food throughout the, the winter that was coming. Rainfall came, they had the most abundant crop that the Indians had ever seen, and they celebrated the first Thanksgiving. For days they celebrated, but the Indians came, brought their deer, brought their waterfowl, brought their corn, and they sang, and they played games, and they preached, and they uh, practiced, and they, and they fellowshiped together. The Pilgrims had an exemplary relationship with the Indians for decades. When an Indian had been murdered by three Englishmen, and those Englishmen were put on trial, the Indians expected merely a charade, a show trial. In short, they expected a miscarriage of justice. In 1630, three Europeans killed an Indian on the Rhode Island border. Two of them were captured and brought back to Plymouth for a trial. One of the three judges that sat in on that trial, a man named John Jenny, he built the grist mill. Naturally, the Indians thought it would be a joke. A mock trial, go through the motions, get it over with, let them go. After all, all they did was kill an Indian. John Jenny found the two men guilty and had them hung. Everybody was equal under the law. Now the Indians could trust the pilgrims. They were people of character and integrity who stood by their word. It's amazing to me that you had pilgrims who came to this nation. And those pilgrims had a love for the Lord and they brought that here and that's part of the fabric. It's amazing to me that when the pilgrims came, there was already a whole community called Native Americans who have contributed to so much and still do to the beauty of this nation. It's amazing that a group would come over with the darker hues of skin 
and they'd come on slave ships. And yet we helped to build this nation. And yet when we all come together, if we do it right, and we've been practicing a long time, at least 400 years, if not longer, but here's another opportunity to get it right. And I actually believe we can. Thus, out of small beginnings, greater things have been produced by his hand that made all things of nothing and gave being to all things that are. And as one small candle may light a thousand, so the light here kindled hath shone unto many, yea, in some sort to our whole nation. Let the glorious name of Jehovah have all the praise. William Bradford The history you've been seeing here is absolutely foundational to our nation. In this history, we find the basis for the freest nation in history, which finds its full fruition in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution some century and a half later. The lessons of the pilgrims are vital to our national life, from their failed experiment with socialism to their establishment of self-governance under God. Share this history with your children and grandchildren before it's lost. They will certainly no longer learn it in a public school. We would like to send you a crucial booklet from Dr. D. James Kennedy, restoring the real meaning of Thanksgiving as our thanks for your generous donation to help this ministry produce and broadcast programming that proclaims the gospel and applies the Bible to key cultural issues of our day. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll free, 877-962-7677 or go online to djkm.org. In a concise and clear way, this booklet explains the truth about the first Thanksgiving 400 years ago and why it's so relevant today. And that's just the beginning. If you're able to give a generous donation of $60 or more, we will send you the booklet plus the full DVD version of The Pilgrims, the documentary you've seen portions of on today's program. This hour-long program features Dennis Prager, Alveda King, William Fetter, and many, many more, and contains bonus material you won't find on any broadcast. This is an essential resource to share with your children and grandchildren. And we will also include the book Lessons on Liberty by Dr. Peter Lilback, designed for all ages and packed with colorful illustrations, this entertaining and educational hardcover book uses a simple alphabet poem to guide the reader through the fundamental principles of American liberty. It's put together in a way that engages young people, but has much to teach even the most ardent student of American history. These resources also will make excellent Christmas gifts, so contact us right away to receive them in time. That's the booklet, Restoring the Real Meaning of Thanksgiving by Dr. Kennedy, and including a foreword by Dr. Jerry Newcomb as our thanks for your generous donation to help this ministry stand for truth and defend your freedom. And as thanks for your donation of $60 or more, we will thank you by sending you the booklet plus the full DVD documentary, The Pilgrims, including bonus material, as well as the hardcover book for all ages, Lessons on Liberty by Dr. Peter Lilback. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339 or call toll free 877-962-7677 or go online to djkm.org. This week, we stop to give thanks to God for the blessings He has poured out upon us. Even in difficult times, 
through a second year of COVID and a presidential administration hostile to the unborn and to biblical values, we have so much to be grateful for. As the scriptures tell us many times, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And indeed, gratitude is the missing ingredient in our society today. President George Washington, issuing the first proclamation of Thanksgiving in much more difficult times, declared that the day should be set aside, quote, to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be, that we may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care and protection of the people of this country. If a president were to offer such a glowing summons to worship God today, he would be roundly denounced by the media and likely find himself on the receiving end of an ACLU lawsuit. This is why Thanksgiving stands out in such sharp cultural contrast today. Many of the social pathologies that plague us today thrive on resentment and ingratitude, the very opposite of Thanksgiving. Socialism and communism are premised upon resentment against those who have acquired more wealth or status, and its proponents stoke the fires of envy and division. So-called intersectionality invented by cultural Marxists and propounded in our universities encourages people to view themselves as oppressed on multiple levels according to their sex, sexual preference, gender identity, and skin color, among many other characteristics. The common thread in all of this is a refusal to be thankful and a seething resentment that says, I am at the center of everything, and I deserve better. Dear friends, the cure for this is giving thanks to God. Those who truly understand their position before God can say, along with the Apostle Paul, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's grace is, by definition, undeserved. And we thank Him because all good things we have, and there are many, come to us through His hands. D. James Kennedy Ministries is standing for truth and defending your freedom. I'm Frank Wright. Happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. And here's a look at the next truths that transform. Calling a convention of states is a way to take power back from the federal government and return it to the states and to the people. And so that's really the entire purpose is to restore self-governance to America. That's next week. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.